Hello and welcome to the Post to Post podcast. Uh, I've just said this before. Um, I have no idea what number of podcasts this is. I think it's maybe 42. Uh, anyways, we are back. Uh, we were supposed to do this last weekend, um, but I was traveling and uh, you were traveling. It just wasn't going to work. So You were traveling and it was a special day for you too. I guess. I mean, I'm 32. I, uh, it's not really special anymore. But, but birthdays were never really special. I'm never the person to uh, make a big deal of my birthday. I'd rather just people kind of... Treat it as a normal day. Well, you know you're old when you'll never score as many points in a crib hand as uh, <laughs> as your age. Yeah, 29 was the 29 last was it. year. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. So, <clears throat> like I said, we didn't get to do this last weekend. So, uh, normally this weekend would have been having a yak on our second channel. Um, but we're here talking some hockey. And it's probably a good time to talk some hockey. Oh, uh, because you think? <laughs> because of the playoffs, yeah. oh because of goodness. everything that's going on. Yeah. Uh, what an exciting time. Uh, lots of stuff to talk about. So usually after games, most of the time I make some game recap videos. Because we're doing the podcast today, I thought that it would be a, if I thought it would be a good idea to cover the games last night in today's podcast. Perfect. Perfect. Instead of doing a video for it, mm-hmm. I like it. So uh, we can start with the Pittsburgh Washington game because that was on first. Sure. Uh, we watched that together, mm-hmm. and that was a really interesting and frustrating game to watch because the first period was I would say a typical a typical hockey period. The second period, uh, the first period was a typical hockey period that ended probably not how it should have. It probably should have ended one nothing or one one, mm-hmm. uh, but it ended two one for Washington, which was weird because with two minutes left, basically it was one nothing Wash uh, one nothing Pittsburgh. Um, in the second period, Washington looked terrible, absolutely terrible, the worst, the worst ever. I, I don't remember seeing them play that badly, <laughs> and we talked back and forth the two of us about how awful they were and how they were not in this game. 15-4 were the shots in the second period, I believe. Something like that. Unbelievable. Um, Holpe was the only reason that it wasn't Mm -hmm. probably 5-6-2, something like that, by by the end of the second. Um, The third period was a little bit of the opposite. Washington came back. Uh, Pittsburgh looked to be a little bit flustered. Um, But Washington had 15 giveaways that game. They were just, they were not on their game at all. Um, they made it a, an adjustment in the third period. Barry Trotz put Verena on a line with Ovechkin. Seemed to work. They mm-hmm. combined for a goal, um, and it was a very important goal of the game as well. Um, but on the Pittsburgh side, Kessel looked really good. I noticed the announcers were, were saying that as well, that Kessel looked to be um, skating a lot better than he usually does, and I think it was apparent for viewers as well uh, watching the game. Um, I thought the refing in this game was pretty questionable, and... I say that compared to the game that I watched after that, which was the Winnipeg Nashville game, mm-hmm. where they just let them play. They weren't calling everything, and like that's what I don't understand. That's what's frustrating. These officials have the same boss, so how is the same boss allowing two different styles of refereeing in the same NHL playoffs? Mm-hmm. It doesn't make sense to me. You, there's no consistency, and that's what's that's why people are frustrated, including myself. Um, a question moving forward is, do you think that uh, Mike Sullivan would consider switching up the Pittsburgh lines? Because there are teams out there who juggle lines constantly. Montreal is one of them. Pittsburgh is not one of those teams. Usually they have uh, their lines pretty solidified. Jake Gensel has been playing with Crosby. Malkin usually plays with Kessel. I know there's been some changes recently, but mm-hmm. um, do you think that they consider uh, switching things up? I don't really know enough about the chemistry in Pittsburgh to know if that is a reasonable possibility or not. I do know that from my layman's watch of the game last night, Pittsburgh played as the better team for most of that game. Yeah. And they didn't win the game, but it was close enough that I don't think Pittsburgh has a whole lot to be ashamed of there. Uh, so I, I wouldn't touch much. I think the chemistry is not too bad. I think Washington, on the other hand, they have... I don't think they're going into the next game with a lot of confidence, even though they just won this one. I think they all realized they got, they got lucky. Mm, I agree. And uh, so I, I, if I was Pittsburgh, I would probably stay the course, maybe one or two minor substitutions or something, but I wouldn't change the lines. Mm. And they're going back to Pittsburgh mm-hmm. for game six. Uh, Pittsburgh's one of the best home teams in the, in the NHL, I think the second best actually. So Washington ha- really has it out for them to win that uh, close off the series but can, can someone get that horn out of what's his face's hand so we don't hear that dee, dee, oh, yeah. dee. i hate that horn pittsburgh i hate it 
I just hate it. Yeah. In good. fact, I want Pittsburgh to lose the series partly because I want that horn to stop. Whoa. I'm serious. It's just yeah, the worst the racket. Is annoying. <laughs> it, it's just, and they never, did. <clears throat> back when I was a younger man, maybe even before I was a man, uh, in the Montreal Forum, they had this guy and his name was Dutchie. I don't know who he really was, but that was his nickname, Dutchie. And he would be up in the top row somewhere with a trumpet or a bugle. And he would do some da 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 you know, kind of things like that. And I don't think he was official. I think he was just a dude, mm -hmm. but he became a bit of a, a fixture in there. And he did his thing from time to time, but it wasn't every 41 seconds that he'd be honking on his trumpet. <laughs> this is crazy. Is it, you think, is it a fan or is it the organization themselves? I think the, it's a fan. The venue. I think it's a fan, but I don't know. I'm sure people will mm -hmm. let us know in the comments. I wonder if anyone else is, is uh, noticed. Yeah. Noticed that the... What is it? Is it a horn? No, notice the horn. It's, it's a horn, right? Well, it's some kind of horn. It's almost like one of those long, you yeah. know, you'd see at the Quebec Winter Carnival or I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a long single, like it, there's no musical <coughs> tones being played. It's one note all the time. Mm. Maybe that's part of the, my problem with it. It's just so damn boring and it drives me crazy. Mm, it's droning. It's yeah. droning and it needs to stop. <laughs> uh, moving on from, uh, uh, actually, prediction. Mm. Uh, what's your prediction for game? Six. Or, yeah, game six. Prediction, I think my in my prediction, I think Pittsburgh is, is going to be the favorite team there. I think Pittsburgh's going to win. Yeah, uh, but that's not who I'm cheering for. <laughs> yeah. I just noticed you're wearing conflicting uh, pieces of merchandise. You've got I a am. Ferlunda hat on and a Rogla I've got the Rogla sweater, sweater on <laughs> and a Ferlunda hat. Yeah. If, if this is driving somebody in Sweden really crazy right now, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> At least he looked a little Christmassy, which is nice. Yeah, Christmas in May. Yeah, Christmas why not? In May. Ho ho ho! But uh, <laughs> this is a a nice combination. I I did want to talk very quickly about some of the international hockey later on that's going on. So mm -hmm. I thought I'd do a little international attire for that. So. You got it. Yeah. Uh, moving on to the Nashville Winnipeg series. Oh man. Uh, or game, sorry, from last night. That was uh, a pretty fantastic game to watch. A um, little frustrating on both sides. There's certain points of the game. Uh, did you notice that Nashville dominated the face-off circle last night? I didn't notice. I, I noticed. <laughs> and I have a reason for not noticing. Oh, because you were concentrating on other things. Well, one of the things being the fact that I didn't see all the face-offs. Yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll talk about that in we a, will. very shortly. We will. Uh, I had to look up the stats this morning, 59% the face-off. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a lot because usually, it's as, huge. as you know, it's 52-48 is really a, an yeah. ordinary number. Like 15, 59%, you know, that's doesn't seem that much above 50 and it's not mm -hmm. but you look at the opposite number which is 41 that's 18 41 points. Be, the difference between 41 and 59 is huge so mm -hmm. uh, and in that game uh there were 59 face-offs <coughs> so 59 okay. percent of 59 face-offs is about 35 wins mm. so not bad um on the other side of the coin nashville had 21 giveaways 21. Winnipeg had 10. Nashville had 21 giveaways. That is, I believe, the most in any uh, playoff game I've seen so far that I've checked. 21 giveaways. And this, this is the team that's supposed to be rock solid. Mm -hmm. This is the team that has four powerful lines that can roll, and they're so strong, and they have such depth. People get, get mad at me because I used to call Forsberg out for giving away the puck. I still do call him out. And uh, there a few other offensive players. And I'm like... <laughs> Proof's in the pudding. Mm -hmm. Like it's it it's. I don't want to see them give away the puck, but they do. It's not. It's a fact. It's not an opinion. Uh, so frustrating to see on Nashville side. If you're a Nashville fan, mm -hmm. I thought Kyle Connor had oh. probably a career game, just Fantastic. like Bufflin did in Game Five. I think it was or Four, whatever it was. Two goals and th and one assist. And that assist, <laughs> I think, was sweeter than the two goals. Oh, where he puts it between his own legs and flips it over to Shifley. I think it is patience. Yeah. Oh, unbelievable. It was beautiful. He he came out of his eggshell right there uh, yep. last night. And, and God knows what he can do. Mm. He's only 15 or something, right? <laughs> Good grief. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, another thing to note is the, the Nashville trap, what they're doing in, ne in the neutral zone, a ver variation of the trap. Uh, they're really just overwhelming the puck carrier moving into through the neutral zone and into the zone and forcing him to dump the puck without allowing the wingers to, to gain speedy entry to mm -hmm. retain the puck. Um, so that's... That's boring hockey to watch as a fan, but mm -hmm. it's a very effective. 
and uh, I think Winnipeg started to utilize their speed a little bit more uh, towards the end of, of last night's game mm-hmm. to, to try and break that trap. The first period was a, a quite a shutdown clinic by Nashville. It was. It was really well done. Yeah. And I don't know what changed for the rest of the game, mm. but once that breach was, was made uh, in the armor, mm-hmm. in Pekka Rene's armor or the defensive core's armor, away it went. Uh, it, was, it was an incredible game to watch. I don't think that Nashville can outscore Winnipeg. Um, I think the only way that they're going to win is defensively. Mm-hmm. Uh, defense trumps offense in, the, in this specific series, in my opinion. So Nashville cannot uh, go off of their game plan and play try to try to play score who can score the most goals with Winnipeg because they'll lose. So yeah, and I'm still wondering. They won the game when they put Hartnell in, and he was a factor in the game. And then they take him out and they lose. I, I'm still wondering why they did that. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I'm, I agree with that decision because I like Fiala mm-hmm. and he oh, almost yeah. scored last night. Mm-hmm. Um, Pav- or uh, not Pavlik, <laughs> Hellebuck made a very good save, glove save. Um, I really like, like Fiala. I don't, th- I don't like Hartnell. I think he's a liability, um, penalty wise. And, uh, he's, he's a little slow and he's a little old. He's got lots of experience, which is great, but... Um, well, he's that sandpaper that they mm-hmm. wanted, and that's why he was in there. They weren't going to put him in for his hands or his right. speed. Right. They wanted that sandpaper, and they had it, and whether he factored on the score sheet or not, they ended up winning the game. There was a, enough of a chemical change mm-hmm. in the behavior of the two teams that maybe or maybe not was caused by Hartnell's presence. Mm-hmm. I just thought it was, when, when you're in a game, you win a game, you shouldn't be changing uh, too much. But, yeah, I agree. I, and I yeah, don't like disagree with you on Fiala. I think he's a, uh, he's a great talent mm-hmm. as well. And I, he's see, a, I see both sides of the argument yeah, for, for yeah. a change. I wonder what they're going to do next time, though. Yeah, I don't know. Well, speaking of Hartnell and old people, not that he's old, he's in his 30s, but <laughs> um, Mike Fisher yeah. was, is 65% in the face-off circle in the playoffs. No kidding. Not just last night's game, in the playoffs, 65%. Wow. So he's a con- huge contributing factor um, to that great 59% in the face-off circle last night. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, bringing a guy like that out of retirement, or I guess he brought himself out of retirement, but uh, yeah. having him in the lineup is uh, is really, really important. He would have taken a lot of those face-offs, especially since uh, Nashville was the home team and they had the last change. Exactly. So yeah. they put him out there. Mm. Yeah. How do you feel about uh, Becky Rennie being pulled again? That, again, that's again, twice. again, again. That's twice in just this series. In just this series. Uh, I, th- I think there's a big, big concern there. I think... And I don't know what goes on in a goalie's head. I've never been a goalie, but he did play. He has good bounce back games. He what, does. After he's and, been pulled and, and the next you game can't is blame him good. You can't blame him for all the goals that he let. Oh, in. definitely, definitely not. not. Definitely not. But to pull him, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's harm, more harmful to pull him or not pull him. Being pulled during the period, and of course this case it was the third, I guess, is in a bit of an embarrassment because you have to do that skate of shame all the way from one end of the ice. I to think they're already down five two at that point. Yeah, or something like that. So they're not going to win that game. Mm. But then again, being kept in, we see what happened there with Patrick Waugh in 1995. When you're kept in and you don't want to yeah. be in there, so I don't know. I I would certainly have left it up to the goalie. With already being pulled three or four times prior in just these playoffs, mm-hmm. I, I mean, there's got to be concern there. Even if you're a national fan, even if you can't blame him for all the goals mm-hmm. being pulled, you can't. No star goaltender, no starting goaltender gets pulled that many times in the playoffs and mm. uh, can expect to win a Stanley Cup for the team. So yeah. a little bit of concern there. A uh, little, definitely some inconsistency from Pickett Rennie. But. Yeah, and you know, Saros, as you have pointed out before, Saros is no slouch. So no if you have to go with Saros, him. you're still competitive mm. with him. Absolutely. Yeah. I think uh, n- now that Nashville's down 3-2, it's obviously a bad thing for Nashville fans and for the team. But mm-hmm. I think it's also a good thing as well because... They had to face Colorado, which was the underdog, very much underdog team. They handled them, for the most part, pretty mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. Um, but now they find themselves down in a series in a, a must-win scenario, two games in a row. Um, if they can pull this off, this is... R- like th- I think this is re- really good for the National Predators because they're in, putting in a, a scenario, the opposite scenario that they had in the previous series. They need to win, and if they can win, the, it'll build a lot of camaraderie and... and a, more experience for the team. They'll know what it takes to, to come back in a series moving forward. And when you have to play San Jose or Vegas, you could find yourself in the exact same scenario as well. And then if you end up facing Tampa or Washington or whoever, Pittsburgh, especially Pittsburgh, whoever in the finals, um, 
as much res resiliency as you can mm -hmm. muster over the and you'll be able to draw on the experience from three weeks yeah. previously where you were down and you came back. <coughs> P.K. Subban, you know, he's obviously uh, not a shy guy, but he was interviewed in the dressing room last night after the game, after the loss. And he said, we'll just pick up. We're going to go to Winnipeg. We're going to win the game Monday night, and we'll come back here for game seven. Not, a, not You know, we're just mm -hmm. going to keep on tracking. And that's how they have to view it. They, they have to. Game by game, you can't look too far ahead and stuff. Uh, yeah, it's, it's happened. It's over. Luckily... Uh, hockey players seem to have this ability to okay. change the channel in mm -hmm. their mind when it comes to, to another game two days later. Uh, I, th I thought Subban didn't have a horrible game, actually. He, he had four hits. No, sorry, he had more hits than that. He had six hits. He had four block shots. Mm. Uh, so he did his thing. Uh, he, he's not a big guy in the score sheet, but he gets the odd goal from the point. But this is the weird part. Do you know who, just based on plus minus... Do you know who the best defenseman was on the Nashville Predators last night? Um, at home? Yannick Weber. Oh, right, because he scored, he scored a goal. He was a plus one. Yeah. In a, in a game where you lose, what, it was a 6-2? Yeah. He was a plus one. And he was just put in that game. Um, he was, he's, he's, been, he's been out yeah. for, for a while. Yeah, and he, he didn't play big minutes. He was just a little over 10 minutes, yeah. where Subban was close to 30. But, uh, yeah, he's a plus one, gets a goal, yeah. and... Uh, <laughs> they they scratched Emelin and put Weber in for more speed. Yeah, and I mean he got a goal. That little that little bit worked. That's that's one thing that I'm surprised about is the invisibility of Emelin in these playoffs. He hasn't been physical like he has in in many other series and years. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Now when he was with Montreal, I really I was always worried when he was on the ice because he was a bit of a liability mm -hmm. and he wasn't the fastest guy. Right, but he could really paced oh, yes. someone up against the boards and those checks were just tremendous sometimes they were over the top and he ended up in the penalty box but yeah. but he was a guy who would bring it now there were other russians he could talk to on the team like markov and galchenyuk galchenyuk maybe he had a better sense of the team culture i don't know if he's got much of that kind of comfort zone in the nashville dressing room right. but he doesn't seem to be himself mm, yeah i think that's a good assessment for mm. sure um Anything else to add on this uh, series before we move on? Uh, not a great deal. Um, the, of the two players last night, I was surprised, surprised to see the, the other one who was a plus three. Uh, Connor was a plus three right. for uh, Winnipeg. Do you know who the other plus three was? Mm. Never get on the score sheet with a goal or an assist or anything, but he was a plus three. Mm, I have no idea. It was Jacob Truba. Oh. Ah. Yeah, who... Uh, and that's the highest plus minus on uh, on Winnipeg was it was a plus three, so I, was, I thought that was interesting. Now Truba's big game was the previous game or a game earlier in the se in the series where he right. was, you know let her up, but uh, yeah he's still he's still on the ice when good things happen. So cool. that's uh, that's good to know. Yeah, that's it. Well, that's it. Other than for the fact I was going to talk about the faceoffs and stuff, but uh, if you want to move that to later, I'm, um, I'm cool with that. Well, actually. Uh, um Missing faceoffs is, is next on my list oh, to talk about. Cool. I have a comment that I want to read. Mm -hmm. So this is coming from uh, someone named Kyle. Just let me move my mic a little bit. Okay, so if you guys don't know, we made a video recently on why CBC is missing so many faceoffs, and we counted and and stuff. Uh, frustration on on our part, and by the look of the comments, a lot of other people. Yes, a I was, lot of. Other I was people. surprised to see the fairly unanimous yeah. weighing in there. It was good. So this is a, a comment, and uh, I would like to read it. And oops, hold on, it's disappearing because I zoomed in. Uh, crap. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so he says, uh, on my college campus, I work for the television services. It is a good job. It pays well. My point is, making a live broadcast is a hard thing to do. I can say, I can only say for the cameraman and camerawoman because that's my job. But the cameras are consistently looking for something new to see. Um, absolutely right. Totally. Uh, that's their job. You have to look for, for things in the crowd and stuff and, and to see and, and players. He goes on uh, to say, uh, sometimes without uh, much time until the broadcast turns back on, back on your camera. The control room is the problem in the situation for Hockey Night in Canada. There might be uh, a problem with the CBC because of their budget, because uh, maybe they don't have enough cameras to switch to. Um, incorrect. <laughs> No offense, Kyle, that is incorrect. They have 300,000 cameras to switch to, and that's part of the problem. <laughs> um, again, not the cameraman's fault. 
they're doing their job. They're doing a tremendous job, actually. The camera people are are great. A little zoomed in for my taste, but uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, they are really doing a good job. It's 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 not a budget issue. They have the coverage. NHL coverage budget is bigger in the in Canada than it is in the United States um, because of Rogers, and they bought out Hockey Night in Canada or CBC or not CBC specifically, but mm-hmm. Hockey Night in Canada and. We have too many cameras. <laughs> we do. Is there more from Kyle there? Or? There is. Okay. Um, uh, he said, face-offs are very important, and I agree with everything you said. However, I think we do need to give some slack to the control room because they have a hard job. Not an incorrect statement. They do have a very hard job. And um, I believe that uh, the control room is 100% of the problem, but not all of the control room. There's one guy. The, it's the director, whatever title you want to give him, it's, it's one person's fault. Yeah, That person makes the decisions when to switch the cameras, when not to switch the cameras. It's it's not like it's, it's a decision because it's hard. It's his job is hard. The decision is very easy, mm-hmm. extremely easy. It's, and it ha- has nothing to do with budget. It's, it's almost like he's not a hockey fan. And it's his job, and he doesn't know how to follow hockey. Mm-hmm. He doesn't know what to switch to. Or he, like, We don't need to see close-ups of people's faces on the bench when they're doing nothing, have nothing to do with what they're talking about. We want to see the face-off. Why aren't we be- being shown the face-off? Like, That's it. It is, it is the director. <laughs> it's definitely not the camera people. They're doing a wonderful job of yep. finding interesting things for the director to choose from. Definitely. And the director will sit there, maybe in a in an elevated chair that's behind the switchers and some of the other mixer people that do all kinds of things like audio mm-hmm. stuff. And then a, behind him somewhere, maybe even in an office, is a producer. Right. Exactly. So the director is the is the the hands on person, and they'll tell the switcher they'll say, "Ready three, take three. Mm-hmm. And so each camera, of course, has a number. Um, I, I see it the, exactly the same way you do and the same way Kyle does. Uh, we do have lots of cameras to choose from, which is uh, which is correct on your part. And uh, Kyle, you've probably se- or maybe have seen some earlier videos when I talk about the fact uh, we've had too many cameras to choose from because we've lost our ability to track the game properly because we kept, keep getting switched angles all the time as viewers. But in this uh, whole business, they often... It, when I first started recording these a couple of days ago, I thought what I'm going to see is that they've got a 20 second replay package Mm -hmm. that they've got to run with. So they rack that up and they start it hoping that it'll be finished before the face off. And if they get that wrong, when the replay package ends and the the play has already begun, well, that's just bad luck. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I I, I don't mind those. I don't mind When you're watching a replay and you miss a face off, I can understand that. I'm okay with that. And but yeah, exactly. And here's what's happened instead. To my surprise, once I started paying attention, the replay package will end. Then they will show these live shots: the guys in the bench, or a close up of someone getting ready for the face off, or the goalie, or someone in the crowd. And they'll linger on that live shot exactly until after the play has begun. Exactly. I can hear the clickety click of the sticks hitting the ice. Yep. And then count two steamboats, and boom! <laughs> then it comes back. Uh, to the play, and goodness knows what's happened in the meantime. But mm. like you, I want to. I don't like face-offs. I don't like there, that there are that many face-offs in the game. I think they slow the game down. But for as long as there are going to be face-offs, I want to see them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when they happen. Yeah, you're right. And when we're not blanket blaming everyone who works for CBC. When we say that we're blaming CBC, we're blaming the director, but we're also blaming his boss that's allowing this to continually happen. Mm-hmm. So we're blaming the CBC, but not everyone who works for the CBC, if that makes any sense. In the Winnipeg-Nashville game last night, <laughs> there were 59 face-offs, and we were unable to see 20 of them. Hmm. So uh, that's almost a third. Yeah. It's 30, well, it's actually over a third. 33.9% of the face-offs were not visible by CBC viewers during the game last night. And that's the Nashville game. On the other side, Washington-Pittsburgh, there were 73 face-offs, and we didn't see 23 of them. Mm-hmm. And that's 31.5%. So we see a pattern here. We're between 30 and f- low 40s percent of right. missing face-offs this past weekend. And as I said in the actual show that we did about this topic, 
one is too many to miss. I agree. One. Yeah. And now we're in the 20s and 30s and 40s that we're actually missing every game. It's frustrating. As a viewer, frustrating. Yeah. Um, anything else to add on that topic? No. Nope. All right. Mic can drop. Move. <laughs> we can move on to the, to the looking situation. Oh, yeah. Right. So we released a video this morning. People are still commenting on, commenting on it and stuff. Um, I have a question. Well, first of all, the NHL has now warned that a 10-minute 10 mis- 10 minute misconduct will be given, which really does nothing. Dumb. Dumb. Um, takes him off the ice for 10 minutes. That's it. And, and the team's not even penalized because you're not short for 10 minutes. Five on five, yeah. You're five on five. So you've done absolutely nothing. Is that a, is a 10, minutes, 10 minute misconduct an automatic reviewable play by the NHL's first suspension or fines? I don't think so. There's something. I, I think it, any game is con- any 10 minute game misconduct is. Well, a game misconduct might be, but 10 minute might not be. Anyways. Yeah. Um, I have a question for you. This is a little kind of a weird thing to think about and, and ask and, and even talk about, but. I don't know if he's, is, is he married? Is Brad Meshaw married? I don't know. I don't know. I don't think it matters. I'm guessing he's not, if, but I don't regardless, know. Regardless, if if he is gay, if he's a homosexual, does this change things? Is it Does it become sexual assault if he was a homosexual? Well, that's a very good question. I'm not sure how to approach that. I know. Uh, because there's, well, there's a sliding scale now, right? There's every everything in between, and, mm-hmm. and that's fine. Um when is it some when is something just just gross and when is it gross plus uh i don't know i think i think there's an argument to be made that that if if he you would treat that the way he would go up to let's say he was not gay let's say he was heterosexual mm-hmm. uh and maybe that's what he is for all i know and if he were heterosexual and licked a female in the face uh, we would probably see that vastly differently wouldn't we That'd be sexual assault. Well, I think so. If he licked a female. Yeah. So if he's gay, or homosexual, and he licks another man, to me, that's sexual assault. Yeah. <clears throat> it's a weird scenario to talk about. But it is a weird scenario, but I, I fall back to a couple of weeks ago. We talked about, not this, but something else, just about how once you get on the ice, once you've signed the contract to play hockey, there's all kinds of things that happen on the ice that would never happen in real life. Like fighting. Like fighting, or if you're walking down Young Street in Toronto, um, it's not really cricket for someone to walk up and body check you. Right. Or trip you, or do s- all the other things that happen. I call you terrible names from your coworkers and stuff. Yeah. And or just whatever, all those things. So uh, once you get inside the boards of a hockey arena, I think that all of our common thinking about the law and the criminal code and these things really have to take a back seat to mm. the culture of the game. Definitely. So I wouldn't go in the sexual assault realm with this, even if he were uh, gay. I don't think I would do that because it's it's not an act of... of uh, I don't think there should be any... Like, I would consider that sexual assault because he's... Because hypothetically, if he was gay, but I wouldn't like... I wouldn't want charges to be filed or anything like that. Mm. <clears throat> it brings incredible discredit upon the game of hockey, regardless of whether it's a sexual assault or not. It's something. It's not something that would probably ever end up in court. No, uh, no. The, the 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 rarely do things ever end up in court. And you look at the Todd Bertuzzi mugging, right? Uh, that that he did. Uh, that's one of the few that and gets outside of the game. Dennis Weidman mm-hmm. uh, hit on the referee. Yep. Um, yeah. But I think if if this happened in basketball, if LeBron James licked someone else. That would be a suspension in basketball. Definitely. Definitely. I, I would think so. Well, yeah, in basketball, if you get a, a foul for just tapping someone on the wrist. Yeah, you can't, def- <laughs> definitely suspension, 100%. <laughs> uh, I understand the two sports are very different, but um, they are. I, it's, it's just, it's a weird thing that we're even talking about this and that we made that video and that we don't know who he's going to lick next. Well, that's the thing. I'm I'm upset with him for making us go through this conversation. Mm. This is a conversation that <clears throat> two hockey journalists, if, if that's what we are, yes. should never have to have. Yeah. But because of him, we're having it. And and it has to be addressed. And the listeners and the viewers out there have views of their own, and, and maybe they haven't formed their view fully yet. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know if I have. I just know it's, I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, that's all. Yeah. And I just don't know the degree to which I don't like it. Frankly, if... 
having seen it happen, my immediate reaction was, this man should not be in the National Hockey League mm. forever. That that was my initial reaction to that. Right. That's obviously harsh, and Pretty that's harsh. why people need time to cool down. Well, I, I, it's a good segue into the comment that I want to read. Sure. So this was just left on the video that we, that we released, <clears throat> and I apologize because the grammar isn't that well. No offense to, or isn't that great. Uh, no offense to uh, whoever wrote it. So the person says, uh, Brad Marchand is one of the best players in the league. Agreed. That's true. Agreed. True. We said that in the video. Yep. And, and this guy's saying, bench him next game. Laugh out loud. I don't care what he's done because he didn't break someone's jaw and give them a concussion like Tom Wilson. Yet you guys make Brad Marchand out to sound worse than him. That's why I can't really respect this as much. I know he's stupid. He does stupid things, but kicking him off the team, no, that ridiculous. Um, <laughs> number one, don't deflect. I, I made a video saying that Tom Wilson should should have be, been suspended before the ruling of his suspension was even released. So throwing shade to, to that, it makes no sense because we're not making anyone out to be worse than anyone else. Mm -hmm. Tom Wilson did something wrong. We said he did something wrong. So I don't understand that part of the comment, but um, it's it, I understand his, his point when he says that removing him from the game is a little over the top, but I also understand when you said that in the video, your opinion of the embarrassment by the uh, the team to not have him represent their brand. Mm -hmm. And before we started this podcast, I was trying to think of other scenarios in, in not just hockey, but in other sports as well, where a superstar or a player has done something embarrassing and they've been benched or removed from the team um, because they ruined the brand or they whatever and because in the nfl there were some murders and i think there was some steroid stuff in the mlb and players were removed and their contracts were voided and stuff and not obviously licking someone's very different than taking steroids or murdering someone but yeah you Wasn't understand there a, a football player and i vic was it michael vic there was something to do with dog fights or something do you remember oh, that oh right that just dawned on me now right uh, <clears throat> but I, I if, if I'd known I was going to eventually come up with this scenario, I would have done my research, and I haven't, so. I, I vaguely remember that, though, mm -hmm. yeah. And I don't know if that was a league thing or his team thing. Mm -hmm. Also, I know in NASCAR, there was a driver probably about 30 years ago who had some problems with the bottle. Uh, he was substance abuse and that kind of thing, or uh, alcohol, I think it was, limited alcohol. And he took some time out now. I don't know if the team made him do that or the le or the league in this case NASCAR. It's a company, but it's mm -hmm. like a league. Uh, and it was Tim Richmond, I think, is who it was. And he eventually uh, paid some dues for that. Right. I, this is th the different thing about here is this happened on the ice during the game. This isn't right. some indiscretion that someone got caught driving drunk on their way home from a game party or something. This is during the game and it was part of the game, and that that makes this different. Yeah, I mean, I'm not expecting Boston to remove him from the lineup, and I don't even necessarily... I never thought for a... If they did, they'd be idiots. Yeah, they'd be, they'd be totally stupid to remove him from the lineup. We're just saying, from a brand perspective, mm -hmm. that's the right decision. Um, Zach, yeah. Zach Cassian is, a, is the only other hockey scenario recently that I can think of. He was involved in a motor vehicle accident uh, in Montreal when he was traded there, and he, I believe, was potentially under the influence or wasn't confirmed, but he had to go to counseling... Uh, substance abuse counseling after that and then he was traded to mm -hmm. Edmonton and he still had to go through it a bunch and, and eventually ended up playing and stuff. But yeah and the, and the team didn't drag him through things publicly they, right. they did what they did behind the scenes right. in, in a fair way yeah. uh, but this year I just don't know I'm, I'm, I'm casting about trying to think of how you address this if the league won't address it how do you address it? Mm. And obviously those two situations are extremely different looking someone is completely different than substance abuse uh, I'm not comparing the two situations we're just thinking of other scenarios where uh, has similar conversations taking place. And I, I take an old fashioned view of hockey. So my, my comments come from someone who is really not totally happy with the fact that people go to games now dressed up as animals and clowns and <laughs> wear tards. You, you, you know, don't like have that? These, uh, the, the blue man group or what I, that's awesome. No, I, I know it's awesome, but <laughs> I, I, I don't have to like it. Well, I'm, you came I, from the scenario where people would go to games in s full suits. Suits. And, Men yeah. with hats, women with hats. It'd be kind of interesting just to, for one week, if the NHL said, come to the games all dressed up, like it was like retro or heritage week. 
<laughs> and everyone could dress up and come to games. That would be really cool. I think that'd be awesome. Yeah. Even if it was just one game. Just one game. That yeah. would that would be cool. But that'd be really I, I understand cool. where you're coming from. Like the fans need to show respect for the game too. And and they often don't. They come dressed as clowns or something or I don't, see I don't see, or I don't see dinosaurs that. or I don't I don't find that disrespectful at all. I think that's a celebration of the game. Well, but here's what I do find disrespectful is that fan that sits right next to the penalty box. And it's like those two guys Vancouver had, those green guys or yeah. whatever. You think that's dis- disrespectful? Yeah, I totally, totally. Oh, see, I think that's comical. I, I really I, like I that. laugh. I laugh just like the other person. I, I think it's funny when they do their thing and they're dancing and they're trying to get the guy off his uh, yeah, focus. Yeah. I, I, I love it in a way, but I really don't. Can you imagine that exact, those two people going back in time to the 50s or 60s to, in, the, in the forum in Montreal, sitting next to the penalty box and them doing that? They did, they'd... They'd finish the game in a dumpster. Yeah, they would. <laughs> yeah, they which would. is where they probably belonged. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> back then. I understand them. <laughs> Speaking of time travel, if you have sent me this piece of paper with all my notes back, uh, we'll say eight months mm-hmm. before the season started. Right. So I got this piece of paper. I'm like, whoa, this must be from the future. I mean, Nashville and Winnipeg have never played a playoff series against each other. Let's let's look at the rest of this pa- piece of paper. Pittsburgh, Washington, well, that's not really a surprise. They play every playoffs, it seems. That it's probably going to be a good series. Nashville, Washington would, uh, sorry, Nashville, Winnipeg would be a really good series. Uh, missing faceoffs, mm, yeah, that, I'm, I, I'm not surprised. I'm, I would be talking about that. That's mm-hmm. that's a, uh, an issue now, eight months ago. Um, and licking. <laughs> Why do I have licking on this list? Yeah. What, what? What's going on eight months from now where I'm talking about licking? Did some team give another team a bad enough beating that they said, boys, if Nashville gave a licking to Winnipeg the other day? That's probably literally what I would... That's what I would have thought. But I also have down here 10-minute misconduct and then sexual assault if gay, (laughs) question mark. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, weird. It's a weird day. It's a weird time. Uh, Next on my list, if we can move on. Sure. Is the NHL draft, something we haven't really discussed. Mm Mm-hmm. Excuse me. So there was some teams who jumped up the the ladder mm-hmm. and uh, got pretty lucky. Uh, I'm going to read you the list of the top 12 teams in order of how they were uh, drawn, I guess, or whatever, drawn. Uh, Buffalo's number one. Carolina is number two. Montreal is number three. Mm-hmm. Ottawa's number four. Arizona's number five. Number six is Detroit. Number seven is Vancouver. Number eight is Chicago. Nine is the Rangers. Ten is Edmonton. And 11 and 12 are both the Islanders because they have Calgary's 12th. uh, They have Calgary's pick, which is number 12, I believe. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to name all of the the players who could potentially get drafted in those positions because they'll fluctuate a bit and uh, yada, yada, yada. But I'm going to name the top four and someone else. So number one, uh, Rasmus Dallin or Dallin, however you want to pronounce it, is slated to go first. He obviously probably will. Slated to go number two is uh, Andre um, Svechnikov, and we got to watch him in the World Juniors. Uh, he did very well. And number three is Philip Zadina, who was also in the World Juniors and did very well. Number four is Brady Kachuk, um, who was also in the World Juniors and did very well. <laughs> Um, and uh, from there, there's names and names and names. But number 10, Edmonton. Noah Dobson is slated to go number 10. My prediction right now is that he will move up this list. I think Noah Dobson will go before 10. Uh, I think I think he'll probably go around 7 or 8. That's my that's going to be my draft prediction. But uh, it's hard to say with some of these picks. Mm. Uh, I mean... Montreal is in an interesting position because they have four second round picks. I believe they have three fourth round picks. They have a really good first round pick. Uh, it's there's been rumors of Pacioretty moving at the draft. Montreal has a lot of pieces to to think about moving in and around here. I'm wondering if they. I don't think they're going to trade up to get uh, Svechnikov for number two. I think Zadina and him are same level. Mm-hmm. The, uh, Svechnikov is 6'2", Zadina is 6 feet even. Very similar style players. I don't see Montreal trying to work up to get Dahlin or Dahlin, however you want to pronounce it. Um, so I don't see Montreal trading their pick. I know it's been rumored. I don't see it. I could potentially see Carolina trading their pick 
for a current player, someone like, honestly, I don't even know. I'm not even going to make speculations as to who, but I can see Carolina because Carolina never expected to get that pick. I don't necessarily believe they need uh, that player. I think they need to work on their back end a little bit. So I can see them potentially trading that pick. Mm. I don't think they will, but I could I could understand the argument of them uh, doing that. And obviously Buffalo would be crazy to trade their first round pick. Uh, or, yeah. So um, do you have anything to say about the, what, what's your thoughts as a Canadians fan that they moved from fourth to third? Oh, I was absolutely thrilled. I, I opened up some champagne. We moved <laughs> up a notch. Um, <clears throat> I just think that it's such a gamble these days, the draft anyway, mm. that it probably in five years time we'll be looking back saying, huh. You don't know, right? It's you like predictions. Know. Like People are still commenting on my bracket prediction video, making fun of me for picking Anaheim as if they were the genius and <laughs> knew that they were going to get swept. Yeah. It's comical. <laughs> you don't know. You make predictions. You're wrong sometimes and sometimes mm-hmm. you're right. So, And uh, certainly all the teams in the league have been putting a lot of scouting effort into watching these characters play in various parts of the world, Europe or uh, in, in the junior leagues in North America. They likely have a pretty good handle on the potential. Then of course you've got NHL Central Scouting that does a more holist and comprehensive look at everybody but some teams identify certain players and they're below the radar and that team is zeroed in on a player there was a mm-hmm. story i think in the game last night oh i'm trying to think of, of who it was but it was a great story where a, a team had sent a scout to look at player a i think they were somewhere in saskatchewan and while they were there sizing up player a which was the one they were thinking of drafting mm-hmm. he saw a player l <laughs> And he was really impressed with player L. And they never ended up having a crack at player A because he went before they got a chance to pick him. Mm -hmm. But he went back to the head office and said, keep an eye on this player L. We we, we need to get this guy. And they got him. And I think it was like the 27th pick in the round, or maybe it wasn't even the first round. And they got player L, and he's now one of the best players on the team. (laughs) This is a great, who is it? It would be a better story if I could remember who the heck it <laughs> well, was. Good job. Yeah, thanks. But <laughs> but it was it was a great story. <clears throat> and this happened. But this happens all the time. Was it Ehlers? Uh, maybe it was. I don't know. Mm. Did he play junior hockey in the West? I have in the no West? idea. No idea. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm not sure. The, my first thoughts on this draft lottery thing. I just think it's sad that they make it into this sorry spectacle that it is after the second period of one of the playoff games, and they line up these GMs, and yeah. basically it, it, that's the lineup of shame. Uh, hi, folks, we're here in this lineup because we suck so bad last yeah. year that we have a crack at the number one pick this year. And then they have three. It's, it's just like The Bachelor or something. It is, it is a little strange. You're right. It, oh, it does kind of feel like The Bachelor. What did you feel, or how did you feel about them uh, forcing us to wait to find pick one, two, and three? Uh, after like they w- I mean they made us wait till the second, in- the second uh, intermission yeah. to release those final three ones. What do you how do you feel about that? Well, as a viewer, I, I want to know now. It's the the decision's already been made. They just haven't flipped the card over yet. Yeah, and just why drag it out? But I understand why. There's they want to keep the viewers engaged. They want to people to see it in real time. Mm-hmm. So I understand why they do all that dog and pony crap. But I I'm not in. Uh, in fact had I not been watching the game anyway, and that came up, I probably wouldn't have bothered even making a, a point to try to watch it because I just would have said, well, I'll read it in the paper or mm. online tomorrow. Do you want Montreal to draft Zadina? Um, well, the, the little bit I've seen him play, I wasn't overly impressed, but <laughs> I'm not a scout. I, I watched Connor McDavid play in person when he was uh, playing for the Erie Otters. I wasn't impressed. You weren't there. impressed. <laughs> I wasn't impressed. I thought he was lazy. I thought he was Ovechkin-like. He was great when he had the puck, and when he didn't have the puck, he just glided back to the bench, and And uh, I thought he was lazy and not putting in very much effort. You'd be a terrible scout. I'd be awful. <laughs> I'd be just awful. So maybe that's why I'm making the big bucks in the podcast. I, I really like Zadina. Uh, mm-hmm. The only thing I... The only thing I'm concerned with him about is his cherry picking. He was cherry picking so much. Obviously, the queue is different league. You can get away with that stuff in, in the queue. Uh, in the NHL, that's not going to fly. Mm-hmm. There are certain players who are very good about uh, and sneaky and getting around the defenseman and, and uh, sneaking behind there for breakaway passes. And Zadina was trying very hard to do that in the game that I watched uh, in person. But I don't think that flies in the NHL. So mm-hmm. I'm interested to see him play at the NHL level. Now, overall... 
I've not been <coughs> super duper impressed with Montreal's drafting lately. Oh, it's been terrible. Uh, Trevor Timmons and the people, I, I don't know where, where the disconnect is. No offense to the United States, but I thought Montreal drafted an overabundance of American players, maybe overlooking some Canadian players or even European players. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of them, and these are great players. They're coming from the college ranks in New England. They're coming from Minnesota. Uh, the, these are great players. But, you know, the Ryan McDonough's of the world, we drafted Ryan McDonough. Of course, we gave him away. Uh, we drafted a lot of other great players and gave them away. Yep. And Sergachev is another example. Gave him away. So if you're not going to keep the damn player, why'd you draft him? Yeah, like exactly. They need to have a bigger meeting in Montreal. I not agree. just the draft people, but you know, Jeff Molson or whoever it is has to sit down and say, okay, folks, do we actually have a plan for the future? Because if we draft somebody, I'm going to lock this person in for the next 10 years. Mm. They, the only few they've done that with is, is well, Carey Price is, is the last real example of a high marquee type player that they drafted, locked down, and they still have. Suban would have been the most recent one, but uh, gave him away. Gave him away. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I don't get it. Gallagher, I guess. Is, Gallagher is, was is a great an, find. an exception because he's a, a, yeah. the unicorn because he wasn't drafted very high. That's right, and a smaller guy, mm-hmm. hardworking guy. Uh, occasionally, even what's what's the saying? Occasionally, even a oh, I forget what it is, but. You know, a, a, a blind dog will find a bone or something. I don't know what it is. But. Uh, Galchenyuk, I guess, is another example. But there have been so many rumors of him leaving that uh, mm-hmm. I don't know what he's going to do. So yeah. anyways, um, any more thoughts on the draft? Or? Not really. I think there's lots more water to flow underneath a few bridges in New Brunswick and elsewhere before <laughs> we uh, before we get a chance to. Uh, to I think, obviously, you're going to want to do a show prior to the draft with uh, all the players and all the draft order and Mm. And we'll maybe do a mock draft ourselves or something like that. So that'll be the time for it. Definitely, right? yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about free agents, if that's okay. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to l- name you a list of the top 11 free agents. I would say that this year's free agency list is beyond anything in recent years. Right. Number one, John Tavares. Number two, John Carlson, who is having a career season with the Washington Capitals. Mm-hmm. Number three, James Van Riemsdyk. Four, Paul Stasny. Wow. Five, Mike Green. Lots of experience. Mm-hmm. Six, Evander Kane, who's playing brilliantly with the Sharks, minus the suspension. Seven, Ilya Kovalchuk, with his r- potential return to the NHL. Number eight is James Neal. He's a free agent. I think Vegas will lock him down. But mm-hmm. Number nine is Joe Thornton. Ten, David Perron. And 11, Rick Nash. So there's some pretty big names on that list, and I suspect that a few of them will be moving. A few of them won't. I think uh, JVR will, will be moving. Um, I think Mike Green will be moving. I think uh, Thornton has the potential to move, and I think Rick, Rick Nash will be moving. Tavares, obviously, we've had this conversation a thousand times. That it's not really any sense of talking about it anymore. Nothing's changed. Um, we don't know anything. So. Mm-hmm. <coughs> What's your thoughts on, on any of those players? Do you see those players going anywhere specifically? Do you, would you, as a Canadiens fan, would you want Montreal to go after any of those players? I really think Montreal, I'm, I've said this before, I really think Montreal should make a hard play for Tavares. Mm-hmm. A lot of teams are going to be doing it, but I think Montreal should make a hard play. They've got the cap space. They've got some assets that they'd like to convert. Patch ready for sure. Maybe even Galchenyuk, I don't know. Uh, and picks, they've got a dandy pick down if they don't, Yep. You know, a draft pick this year, you're not going to really see production of that, unless they're a, one of these McDavid kind of players. You're not going to see that pick shine and blossom for four or five years maybe before you get them mm. to where you want them on your team. So you can get immediate help right away. If, if you if you got John Tavares in Montreal, you're telling Carey Price that you're serious about trying to win something. And and you're telling the market in your city that you're – and I this applies to every team, not just Montreal – I think they should all make a big play f- for Tavares. Despite the fact that his uh, production has not been that great this last year, maybe uh, due to the fact that wh- who he's playing with and where he is, but... Tavares or, Gal- or Galchenyuk? Tavares. I don't think I don't think his... You don't think his production was very good? Do you know how many points he got? Mm, not offhand. He's close to 90 points, I think. I think he had like 89 points or something. I don't think that's an off year. <laughs> well, no, I guess not. I don't know. I just never saw him... Uh, I, I watched a few games that he was in. I, he just hasn't impressed me. Oh, okay. Th- that, that's just me, though. 
I know nothing. You're you're so. bad scout. I'm bad scout. So. <laughs> so that's why I think they should make a hard play for him. If if, I, if he doesn't impress me, that means he must be good. That's right. Um, but I, I just think overall that would be a great f- mm. uh, fit for Montreal. I think that the team is ready to welcome some superstar. Who was the last superstar we had? Who could score and do great things? Was it Kovalev? If you want to even call him a superstar. Kovalev, yeah. Before that. Pierre um, Turgeon. Pierre Turgeon. Kirk Muller. Like maybe. You're going, and you're already going back now. You're back 25 years. Brian Savage. Yeah. Maybe. John LeClaire, maybe. But even these guys were maybe second tier guys. Yeah. Right? It's. Tavares is a. And he's not the only piece you need. Montreal's got holes everywhere. But that would be a big one right there. He's a perfect player for Montreal. Mm-hmm. And, and as a Canadiens fan, that's not a biased opinion that he's a center and he can score and he's offensive and he's a leader. It's exactly what Montreal needs. So anyways. To- totally. Uh, the last thing on my list, a uh, second last thing actually on my list is uh, Stars have hired a new coach. I don't know if you have that written down or you want to talk about not. it or know any about it. I, I read about it, but I didn't. Uh, Jim Montgomery is his name. Mm-hmm. Do you know anything about him? I do not. He's a coach of the Denver... Huskies, I think their name Denver something. I can't remember exactly what they're. Uh, Denver Pioneers, maybe. Anyways, Denver something. Uh, NCAA. He won the Coach of the Year. Oh. He's got a few championships and titles. Um, he's never coached professionally, but uh, people are excited. I know Stars fans who are very very excited about this signing. Cool. Um, so, good things in in Dallas. I think a, a very unconventional approach to a new coach and uh, giving him a shot. I believe the last coach that came from the NCAA was. Oh, I don't remember his name, but it was in 2015 with the Philadelphia Flyers. Uh, I can't remember his name. I'm not good with. I'm not good with names. Anyways, if you if you know who he is, leave in the comments. But well, I think it's good that there's new blood coming into the coaching ranks of the NHL. Definitely, I think there's been in the past more. It's an easier path, I think, for owners and and GMs to recycle a coach from mm-hmm. some other team that's been fired or quit, and there seems to be the same. You know, set of free agent coaches that rotate around the league over and over again, and they find new places. And it's nice to see someone drawn up from a lower league or even not pro at all Mm. and bring them in because that's how you get in. That's where you come from. Mm. Gerard Gallant, he coached very ordinary hockey in Summerside, Prince Edward Island. Yeah. And then he ended up with the St. John Sea Dogs. And then he ended up, ended up uh, was he with the Islanders for a while? He was an assistant coach with Montreal. In Montreal. And, and then, then he, he went, went to Florida. Florida. And you you just build your resume and you mm-hmm. keep on going. And now he's going to win coach of the year. No question. Like, if, he, if he doesn't, it's rigged. If, if he doesn't, <laughs> NHL 100% rigged. Yeah. Definitely. Worse Definitely. than the KHL. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shade. Um, uh, the only thing left I have on my list isn't necessarily... Uh, NHL related it is hockey YouTube related but it's not NHL related so if you have anything else that's NHL playoff related or anything like that uh, no it's all non NHL <coughs> stuff it was the uh, all things hockey and all teams phase of post to post uh, okay yeah yeah so go ahead I was just going to give a, a quick shout out to uh, my boy Adi James um, oh yeah he he's another YouTuber I think he has like 712 subscribers met him in person super awesome guy Vlogs with him on the on my second channel, more post to post. If you guys don't know about those, um, we all met up in Toronto went to go see a Jays game. Uh, he's been releasing a ton of content recently and very unique content because he's he's uh, very good at collecting memorabilia and getting autographs from people. If, if if you watch his videos, then you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But he mails cards and, and photographs out to players. They sign them and send them back. It's a really unique process. Something that I've never done. Uh, but something I think that a lot of people would be interested in. And he's going through a bit of a tough time. He's uh, he's not seeing the growth of his channel that uh, he'd like to. And even for even for us, um, growth has really been slow lately in views and stuff. And I don't know if that has anything to do with the, us not being monetized. But uh, anyways, it's been slow on YouTube for, for I think, a lot of people mm-hmm. um, in the hockey community. And he's just uh, getting discouraged and getting a little frustrated and I wanted to give him a shout out because his content's really good. Yeah. He provides a really unique pr- perspective on things. Uh, if you guys are into collecting memorabilia, jerseys, anything like that, definitely go, please go check out Audie James on, on YouTube. He talks about baseball as well. If you follow the MLB or anything like that. He's quite a baseball player of his own, I believe. Yes, he is. He plays, uh, I think double A, triple A baseball, something like that. 
Um, so huge sports guy. Uh, he's linked in the main post to post channel on the side on YouTube, or you can just search Audie James. You'll find him. Audie is A U D D I E. If yeah. you're looking for it, and uh, throw him a subscription. Check out some of his videos. You won't be disappointed if you collect memorabilia, memorabilia hockey cards, anything like that. You're not going to be disappointed. So I'm, go I'm check him out. really pleased when I see him come on with a video that I got this card back from. I love whoever. those videos. I those love, are I watch great. Every single one. He describes what he did. He sold. He sent the card <clears> and, and <throat> all the ways that you can make it easier for the player to sign and come back. Sometimes you might send two cards to a player and only get one of them back. Yeah. Players don't want uh, to really feed eBayers right. or auctioneer type folks. So Audie realizes that <coughs> and uh, he's keeping these for his own collection, which is even better. Mm. But, uh, he, and not just the sending things away, but standing in a certain spot at the arena and when to get the players after yeah, practice. Yeah, because he lives in Calgary. Yeah, I think it's great. He knows what players will and won't sign usually and stuff. Yeah. Uh, so it's really, he's really knowledgeable when it comes to that Really stuff. knowledgeable. And he's a very well-spoken young man. Very well-spoken. He's going back to school again, mm -hmm. uh, and he's also working full-time. There's no, no wonder that he doesn't have a lot of time for YouTube if YouTube is not responding back to him in the way that he probably deserves. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely go check him out. That would be awesome. Yeah. Uh, support other hockey YouTubers for sure. Stole that line from Andrew Pillock. Shout out to Andrew Pillock. Go subscribe to him too. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's all I got on my list. Um, what, and you want to talk about some world? Well, just a few things. There's, there's lots of other hockey going on. And I know that when you get wrapped up in the NHL playoffs, sometimes you forget that there's other hockey out there. Well, I get comments all the time recently. You're going to cover the world championships or whatever it's called that's going on. And honestly, mm -hmm. I always comment back, I haven't followed any of it. I don't know who it's, who, I don't have no idea who's won any single game. I don't know what's going on because I literally don't have time. And it's unfortunate if I could do this full time, I'd watch all those games, but I'm just, I don't, I don't have time. The world championships are, are interesting because they happen at a time of the year when the National Hockey League is only in the second round of the playoffs. You said it. You didn't say NHL, you said National Hockey League. Well, I think it's okay to say it here. But no? You, you did the thing that you hate. I know I did. I, I, <laughs> If I only, if, if I never did the things I hate, I wouldn't do anything. Uh, but we're in the second round of playoffs here in North America. A lot of our players are European players and they can't play for their countries either. But what happens is the teams that don't make the playoffs or that drop out in the first round can send players or players from those teams that have now some free time rather than go play golf. They can go in this case to Denmark for a few weeks mm -hmm. and play in the world hockey championships. And that's where some of them went to. So people like Connor McDavid and, and folks like that are there playing for Team Canada and other players for other teams. Interestingly, the other leagues that feed the players to this kind of tournament have mostly concluded, mm. not all of them, but uh, have mostly concluded. <coughs> um, Sweden, they're, they're done. Oh, really? Uh, yep, Sweden's done. And it's the uh, Vexio uh, Lakers won four straight over Skelleftea. So mm. they're the champions of the uh, Swedish Hockey League. In Finland, in Liga, um, Karpat beat Tapara four games yes, to two. Yes, because we just got a bunch of... And we got some Tapara merch. merch. merch so they yeah. came second. I got the, my Tapara slippers on right now, as a matter of oh. fact. Oh, yeah. In <coughs> Germany, in the DEL, Munich beat uh, the Ice Baron Berlin four games to three. So that went to seven games. In Norway, in the Getligen, Storhammer beat Lillehammer four games to one. Ooh, I that. love those names. That's a lot of hammers going on. Storhammer. Oh, yeah. man, that's awesome. In the Swiss National League, Zurich beat Lugano 4-3. That was a bit of an upset because uh, Lugano finished fourth and Zurich finished seventh, and Zurich actually ended up beating them in seven games, so mm. that's pretty cool. And in the EIHL, quite some time ago now, of course, Cardiff yeah, beat Cardiff uh, Devils, Sheffield uh, one again. One. Yeah, so, uh, so that's pretty cool. Is it bad that the only other championship that I, like the only championship that I knew of, uh, <laughs> was the EIHL in England, a very untypical hockey place. <laughs> Although you can't really say that anymore because the sport's growing so massively over there in the past couple of years that it's, it's I mean, the hockey's becoming very huge there, yeah. which is amazing. While we're taping this, Sweden and Czechoslovakia are playing in Pool A in the World Championships. That game's underway. Russia earlier today beat Austria 7-0. Ooh. Canada played this, its first game against the United States and lost 5-4 in a shootout to the Americans. Mm -hmm. Canada played their second game this morning and beat South Korea 10-1. <coughs> I would hope so. Yeah. Uh, other teams that, have, uh, that are near the higher end of the standings, Sweden, uh, France, Finland, Latvia, 
So there are games that will continue over the many mm -hmm. coming days. There's eight teams in each side. So I'm guessing that you, if you're one of the eight teams, you have to play seven games to get the round robin done. Mm -hmm. And they've only played two or three games so far. So it'll go on for another week or two. Is there women's stuff happening as well? Um, not internationally that I'm aware of, but some women's things did happen uh, locally in North America, at least. Um, the national, or no, the NWHL women finals, the Metropolitan Riveters beat the Buffalo Buttes one nothing, uh -huh. or, or one game to nothing. And uh, in oh. the CWHL, the women, the Kunlun Red Star fell two games to one to the Markham Thunder. Oh. Yeah, so that's, a, but Kunlun Red Star from China got that, into the finals. So that was the finals. That was the finals, yeah. I think last year the, uh, I can't, I think I watched the finals, the final game of last year. Um, I didn't follow it this year, unfortunately, but. Mm -hmm. The KHL. Andre Markov's team, Akbar's Kazan, won the won the mm. uh, won the whole thing. Four four games to one over CSKA Moscow. I guess the KHL isn't uh, not as crooked as we not thought. As crooked as we thought. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I take back things I said about the KHL in the past. Maybe definitely. Um, how about the SPHL? Oh yeah, there was a big upset. Uh, not really an upset, but I think Pure lost, right? Uh, no, they didn't. Uh, in what I'm seeing here, hopefully my sources are, and I didn't use ESPN, uh, there are still some uh, semi or quarterfinals on the go. Oh, okay. The Peoria Rivermen are up uh, two games to nothing on the Roanoke Dogs. Oh. The Pensacola Ice Flyers are trailing two games to none to the Knoxville Ice Bears. Uh, the Macon Mayhem are up two games to one on the Evansville Thunderbolts. And the Huntsville Havoc lead the Mississippi River Kings two games to one. I think I was... I can't, maybe I was thinking of a different league. Maybe so. I don't know. Anyways. In the AHL, uh, the Lehigh Valley Phantoms and Charlotte Checkers are tied one game apiece in their series. The Toronto Marlies are up two games to nothing on the Syracuse Crunch. Game three of that is today. Uh, Manitoba Moose are trailing two games to none to the Rockford Ice Hogs. And the Tucson Roadrunners and the Texas Stars are tied at one game I guess game there won't apiece. be a repeat champion this year because the... Uh, Grand Rapids Griffins aren't on your list. They're of not teams, on my list. So. Nope. Good to see. Uh, good to see a different champion every year. Mm-hmm. Um, <coughs> the ECHL. That's the Leo's week. Okay. Uh, the Adirondack Thunder and the Manchester Monarch Monarchs are tied two games apiece. The Florida Everblades lead the Orlando Solar Bears three games to one. No. Yes. The Fort Wayne Comets are uh, three two over the Toledo Walleye. Heck game yeah. So far. And the Colorado Eagles have already advanced to the next round. They swept Idaho four games Ooh. straight. Steelheads? Uh, the Eagles, says here. Colorado Eagles. No. But I, I oh, the Idaho Steelheads. Steelhead. Okay, sorry. I, I didn't write it down. So oh, so, I think, think they're Steelheads. I think you are probably correct. Um, now, w one thing that I wanted to close off my stuff with was the incredible run of the Charlottetown Islanders in the QMJHL playoffs. Right. Since... This is the first podcast since the uh, the Charlotte and Islanders were defeated. I talked a little bit about that in a recent video that you probably didn't watch because you don't watch post to post videos anymore. But. I don't watch them all. <laughs> I watch almost all. You watch the ones that you're in. Well, <laughs> they're the best ones, right? Yeah. Um, anyway, the um, Charlotte and Islanders weren't supposed to even get in the playoffs. If you look back at the early early in the season, mm -hmm. they started off one six and one, and it was. No way. Abysmal. They got to Christmas time. It was like they have, they're able to knock on the door of getting in the playoffs. And then in the early part of this 2018 year, mm. they kept doing well and got in, snuck in to the playoffs and instantly took down the Halifax Mooseheads and swept them. And then they, no, no, Quebec Rempire swept them. And then they played Halifax. Did they sweep them too? Um, what? They didn't sweep. The, are you talking about the Islanders sweeping yeah. people? The Islanders didn't sweep no one. They, sw they swept Quebec. I'm sure they did. I don't think they did. Let me get my phone. My phone knows I know everything. I, they definitely didn't sweep Halifax. Okay. I know that. Hey, you're getting your phone out. Battle of the phones here. Uh-oh. I need this. <laughs> Who's going to find this first? <laughs> All right. Hockey. Standings. Okay. Oh, come on. Oh, I don't want that. Playoffs. Here we go. I'm there. 
<laughs> in the first round, the Charlottetown Islanders beat the Quebec Rempire four, game, four games to three, so it was the best of seven. In the next round, the Charlottetown Islanders swept the Halifax Mooseheads for nothing. Was it really for nothing? It was really for I don't nothing. Remember that. In the next round, they took the Blainville Boisbriand Armada, which is the team that has uh, Alex Barry Boulay on it, mm -hmm. all the way to Game Seven, and lost, I think, six-one in that last game. Yeah. And that's when they bowed out. Had they won that game, they'd be going to the league finals right. against Acadie Bathurst. Uh, Acadie Bathurst beat uh, Victoriaville to four straight to get in the finals. <coughs> and right now, Acadie, Bathurst, and Blaineville, Boisbriand are tied one game apiece. Ooh. Yeah. But a tremendous run on, on the part of Charlottetown. Really well done. And this bodes well for next year. Because next year, the Memorial Cup is going to be hosted by Halifax. So the QMJHL gets two entries because it has to be a four-team tournament. So if Halifax doesn't win the league, uh, they will be in along with whoever wins the league. If Halifax wins the league and is in as the home team anyway, then the second place finisher, right. the, the loser of the final, right. goes in and be the fourth team. Right. And we saw the Windsor Spitfires last year go in as the home team, not even the seeded team, and win the whole damn thing. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So who knows? Next year, if Charlottetown can make it into that top two, they can go to the Memorial Cup for the first time. It's an interesting format. For sure, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's the the way that hockey in Canada works with different provinces and stuff. And there's been rumors of renaming the Q to Maritime as something. Yeah, you know. well, right now it's the QMJHL in English, which is the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League. Right. It could easily be switched to the Quebec Maritime Junior Hockey League. Yes. That's easy because yeah. we're they don't have a team in Newfoundland, so we can call ourselves the Maritime. Mm. There already is a Maritime Hockey League. Yeah, uh, which has the Summerside Capitals and the yeah. Cape Breton Screaming, uh, no, 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 uh, no uh, Sydney something. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> the Miramichi Timberwolves. Timberwolves, yeah. Uh, but anyway, in Canada, we have three junior, major junior leagues. <clears throat> and the problem with with the name of the Quebec League, of course, is because it's, it's a shared French-English mm -hmm. name that we have to have. And... Uh, in it's uh, it's either the LJMHQ or the LMJHQ. I think it's that second one. So it's a Ligue Majeure Junior Hockey de Québec. So Majeure, the M in in French is Majeure. Uh, in English, it's Major. Could yep. you switch that to Maritime? Could you have Ligue Maritime Junior Hockey de Québec? Like it doesn't. You almost have to have Quebec and the Maritimes together in the in the initials. Yeah, but they're French and they're not going to want to change that. <laughs> oh, I, I think they'd be open-minded. I, I know don't that think so. The president of the league has said we need to do something. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, well, good on him. Yeah. Good for yeah. them. No, he's, he's responded to that saying, you know, this is, we have to find a way. He didn't agree to a certain way, but we have to find a way to try to make the name of the league geographically correct mm. because there are actually f three other provinces that contribute teams to that league. And they can't have... The Q, and then a separate league for the three teams that aren't, or whatever the teams, or the four teams, the Cape Breton team, Halifax Mooseheads, Charlottetown, and Moncton. And, and St. And, uh, Bathurst. St. John. Oh, and Bathurst. Yeah. yeah, so there's actually six teams down here. Yeah. Uh, and we're all in a, the same division, along with Ramuski and uh, Sethiel and a few other places, I think. Yeah. So, yeah, the eastern part. Um, now, there are two other leagues in Canada, and I should not forget those, the Sault Ste. Marie Greyhounds. Uh, beat the Hamilton Bulldogs 4-2 uh, to two, uh, in the most recent game. So those two teams are tied 1-1 in their series. And the Everett Silvertips uh, lost 4-3 uh, to the Swift Current Broncos in overtime, and they're now tied 1-1. Mm. So there are six Canadian teams in the junior circuit left alive, and a lot of the players on these six teams are going to be in the draft list that we talked oh, about yeah, a while definitely, ago. Definitely, yep. yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's all you have, and that's all I have. Yeah. Well, today we're going to have some fun. We're going to be watching Boston Tampa Bay this afternoon. Yes. And then tonight, it's uh, it's going to be a tremendous game. I'm nervous. Are you? I'm. I mean, I'm excited. You're nervous because you well, because you're worried San Jose might lose. Here's the thing. I kind of teased this a little bit. If Vegas wins uh, tonight, 
and they move on to round three, I have been offered guaranteed tickets to um, a home game in Vegas for round three. 100 percent so if vegas wins tonight i am 100 percent going to vegas for round three for probably game three whoever they face whether it's winnipeg or nashville um i don't know the date of that yet it's going to be between may 13th and 19th it depends on a whole bunch of stuff uh it'll be around there whenever that game th- first game three home game because they don't have home ice advantage whoever they play mm-hmm. because winnipeg and uh, Nashville both seated higher than in the, than them in points mm-hmm. in the Western Conference. So, um, if you live in the Vegas area and if Vegas wins tonight, um, I'll probably be doing a meetup in Vegas at some point somewhere there. Uh, again, this is still all hypothetical because I'm assuming that San Jose is not going to come back and win. Um, but hypothetically, if Vegas wins, then I'd like to do a meetup in Vegas, and I think that would be fun. And uh, uh, if anyone has any tips or anything like that, uh, as far as what to see and where to stay, I'd I'd like to spend, I'd like to fly in the day before the game, stay the night, uh, spend some time in Vegas during the day, go see the game that night, the following day, spend an entire day, maybe traveling outside the city, maybe rent a car just for the day, go see the Hoover Dam, do something, I don't know. Um, come back, stay the night, and fly the next morning. Mm. That's what I would like to do. So if anyone has any suggestions of what to do uh, or the best place to rent a car or the best hotel to stay at, something like that, that's... I'm going to be in the process of booking flights and trying to find the best deals and stuff like that. So if anyone has any suggestions, let me know. Obviously, again, hypothetical because we don't know if Vegas is going to win. So... Mm-hmm. And a big thanks to Chris for for offering his tickets. He's actually uh, he has the tickets and he's traveling and he won't be able to go. He's going to, I believe, Italy or somewhere. So I'm not sure of Chris's last name. And I don't want to say it on here because I don't know if he wants anyone to know. But uh, big thanks to Chris for even making that offer, regardless if it happens or not. So mm-hmm. pretty cool. I'd love to be your travel buddy for that. But yes, I'm, there's I'm in Ohio, <coughs> so <laughs> or I, I will be. There's going to be two tickets, and I do have a second person available. Um, or willing to come with me, and I won't reveal who that person is until um, this situation becomes a reality. So, are they a post-to-post uh, person, like a, a fan or a subscriber? They or? are a subscriber. Cool. They are a, a, a Patreon member, and they live not too far away. Ah, so from from there. Yeah. So yeah. they're American. They're American. Yeah. Right now. They're yeah, American, Texas. Yeah, oh yeah. So. Excellent. Should be fun. Should be should be a lot of fun, actually. And if that ha- does happen, I'll be making videos the entire time I'm there. I'll be making vlogs. I'm going to be making normal videos there. Uh, just all kinds of stuff. It's going to be a ton of fun. Once in a lifetime opportunity. Normal videos. Abnormal videos. Abnormal videos, yeah. Very excited. Well, it's the place to be. Yeah, uh, definitely. This is, and it's a, this is history. You're, you're, a, you're going to be able, if this happens, you're going to be able to be a witness to history. First year expansion team. The best expansion team ever in the NHL. Third round. Third round. One round away from the Stanley Cup uh, finals. Crazy. I and, have to go. And you know something? If you go in person, you're going to see every face-off. I'm going to see every single face-off. That's yeah. incredible. <laughs> I can't remember the last time I saw every face-off. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, it's, it's exciting. It's very exciting. But if anyone has any any suggestions, like I said, deals on hotels or flights or anything like that, let me know. Anyways, regardless, moving on. You're a AAA member, so you get the discounts on that stuff. I guess, that makes yeah. any difference. And All right. Well, yeah. thanks for joining me for this podcast. Well, it was Appreciate a lot of fun it. to get back in the swing, so we'll be having a yak next week. Yeah, next weekend, having a yak. And yeah. the week after that, I'm in Dayton, Ohio. Uh-oh. So I don't know what we do. Well, the, I, don't, I might not be here either. I don't know when. Oh, that's right. You'll probably be. I don't know when this the, this... The games fall, so you should you, you should do your podcast from Las Vegas. Heck yeah, definitely and upload it from there. Definitely, boom. I don't know if I can upload it from there, but I'll definitely do it from there. Uh, how much equipment can you take with you? I can't take all this stuff. Yeah, I can take the lapel mics. That that's might be e- what you. That's have to easy. Do. And maybe w- if your uh, travel companion wants to be a part of the podcast, that'd be awesome. Yep, he definitely would. That'd be great. Yep. All right, uh, appreciate you guys w- uh, watching on YouTube if you are. Uh, if you are and you're not subscribed, please hit the subscribe button. If you like this podcast, hit the like button down below on YouTube. If you're listening on iTunes or Google 
play music or whatever you want to call it or any podcatcher whoever you listen to this i uh, really appreciate it uh, we we love that everyone comes back to the podcast every single week and spends their time watching it or listening to it because it's not a it's not a short thing we're at a an hour and 15 minutes, Ooh. basically, right now. So uh, it's a huge time investment in your life. My so. goodness, you're long-winded. Yeah, I know, right? The, the fact that you uh, include us in your life is uh, pretty special. So thank you for that. Really appreciate it. Hope you guys are having a good day, watching lots of hockey. We'll see you in the next podcast. Adios.